Arjun was. You know, <laughs> you were talking here, uh, in effect, about how democracy in the how we as a nation in the early days made an agreement to avoid absolutes. We said yep. we're going to put absolutes off the table when it comes to questions yep. of religion. That's what some people call the separation of church and state. It was that we will not organize our politics around a battle yep. for absolutes. Yep. Do you see that in danger today? Yeah, I do indeed. Um, I think I think we're living at a time where uh, it's time for people really to stand up and and be counted and and make very clear where they stand to, on the to, on the separation of church and state. I saw a sign the other day. I'm for the separate a bumper sticker. I'm for the separation of church and hate. Uh, interesting. Twist. Well, yes, that's that's good too. You know, um, uh, in the book I tell the story which which you will remember. Younger younger readers won't of of Charlie Wilson when he was. When Eisenhower uh, wanted to appoint him to be his Secretary of Defense, this was 50 years ago, and Wilson was the CEO of General Motors, and he said, or was reported to have said, that what's good for General Motors is good for the country, and he was jumped on by everybody, and they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, and actually what he said was, what's good for the country is good for General Motors and vice versa, but what they said is, look, even if you're right, that what's good for General Motors is good for the country. We want to know, what would you do if Bush came to show? What if, what if in some instance, some policy, you had to decide as Secretary of Defense, you could see that what was good for the country wasn't necessarily good for General Motors? Then where would your first priority be? They wanted to make sure that his priority was what's good for the country, not what's good for General Motors. And they required him to put his holdings in a blind trust and all the rest of that. Now, imagine the, a politician today saying, well, what I've always believed is what's good for the Baptist church is good for the country. I don't think we should stand for that. I think we should make the same hue and cry. We should say, hang on, we don't mind you having your priorities that way, but if that's what your priorities are, I think we want somebody else to be in office because we want the people that we have in office to put the preservation of the democracy, the preservation of the separation of church and states, the preservation of our secular democracy ahead of their religion. Look what we're doing in Iraq. We're, we're, we're asking the Iraqis to put being an Iraqi ahead of being a, uh, a Kurd or a, a Sunni or a Shiite. And that's a tall order to ask them to do that. That's what we're asking them to do. Well, why don't we ask ourselves to do the same thing? You know, there are a lot of people who would say amen to that, no pun intended. They would say amen to yeah. They would believe with oh, you that no matter, no, matter, no matter what their uh, strong opinions they, about their own faith, they would agree with that. Absolutely but, right. But the issue is that the people who, the fundamentalists who do believe, yep. the, the, take the Bible literally, yep. who do believe they know the mind of God and who do want to see their yep. values articulated in the political process and, yep. in fact, enshrined in our political institution, I don't see them wanting to have a conversation uh, with you about this. Well... I agree. A lot of them don't want to have the conversation. But I think that we ought to say, well, you know, so far, so far, this is a democracy, and that's how we settle these things, with a you, conversation. Did you and notice? if they're not prepared to do that, then I think we have to really seriously think about whether we... First of all, I'm quite... I, I insist they have every right in this country to put the good of their religion ahead of the good of the country. Fortunately, there are enough people who don't see it that way, so that we can tolerate those who do. But we don't have to elect them. What is the most important point of your book that you think has been caricatured or, or, or most deeply misunderstood by your critics? Well, I think, I think the standard claim is I'm trying to destroy religion. And I'm absolutely not trying to destroy religion. I'm trying to, to make sure that religion is not toxic. Everybody knows that there's toxic varieties of religion in every religion. Religion, every reli religion heals, religion kills, right? Absolutely right. <laughs> now, how can, we, how can we steer away from the toxic varieties? And I have, since we haven't done the research that I'm calling for, uh, I can't give a lot of policy recommendations. That would, be, that would be contradicting my claim that until we do the research, we don't know what we're doing. We've got to study religion more. But in the meantime, I have one proposal which I think is really important. And that is, we should have a national curriculum on world religions that is compulsory for all school children, from grade school through high school, for the public schools, for the private schools, for the homeschooling. 
And my, why? Because if we taught the young people of a country this, then you could teach them whatever else you wanted. And I wouldn't worry about religions that, I think any religion that could flourish under those conditions would be a benign, a valuable, a wonderful religion. I think it's only, if you look at the toxic religions, they are all the religions that survive by the enforced ignorance of their young. And all we have to do, I think, is we can tell people, you can homeschool your kids, you can, you can give them 30 hours a week of religious instruction, but you've also got to teach them what the people that are not of your faith believe, and you have to teach them about the history of all the faiths in question, including your own. That's asking a lot of, of people who take religion so seriously that they do not <laughs> want their uh, children or their own minds no. to be competitive with other religions. Well, but how very un-American of them to think that. I mean, this is the land of democracy and of an informed choice. What are they afraid of? The other criticism that I take from your critics, the chief criticism I take from your critics, is that you want to reduce everything to the scientific process, that you believe everything ultimately can be understood by the process of observation and verification, trial and error, including religious belief. Not a, I don't think everything can be understood at all levels using science. No, I think, I think we need philosophy and poetry and history. And I mean, if you include those as sciences... And in one sense, they are. In German, they would be. They're Wissenschaft. Uh, so then history and, and uh, the study of literature and archaeology and, and uh, for that matter, poetics and literary criticism counts as a kind of science. I think everything about religion, everything about everything, can be at least partially understood through the methods of rational inquiry. And I am amused when people say they can't make up their mind whether they say, well, you can't or you shouldn't. And I think mainly they're afraid that you can, and that's why they say you shouldn't try. It's amazing how much we can understand about a lot of things. And I know that one of the reasons that some people are very uh, um, anxious about my book yeah. is that they... They see me as uh, showing how the magicians do their tricks. That's right. That's right. But you see, if we're talking about music, you can go in and you can show how Bach does his tricks and how Brahms does his tricks. You can show how poets do their tricks. You can show how doctors do their tricks. You can show how doctors, how important their bedside manner is. Yes, we can, we can do this. And we can, show, we can show how religions do their tricks, too. And, and every religion does it. Every religion does it. And why shouldn't we understand that just as well as we understand? This, it's, every religion has its own technology for belief maintenance. And we can, we can look under the hood and see how it works. John Cage, the composer, mm -hmm. a year after 9-11, wrote a very moving uh, work uh, in memorial <clears throat> for the victims of 9-11. It was performed at Lincoln Center. He said he was trying to create a memory space uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in that music that he said was inspired by the old majestic cathedrals in France or Italy. Here's a direct quote from John Cage. When you walk into the Chart Cathedral, for example, you experience an immediate sense of something otherworldly. You feel you're in the presence of many souls, generations mm -hmm. upon generations of them, and you sense their collected energy as if they were all congregated or clustered in that one spot. And even though you might be with a group of people or the cathedral itself filled with other churchgoers or tourists, you feel very much alone with your thoughts and you find them focused in a most extraordinary and spiritual way. Now, you wouldn't explain that as a trick, would you? Trick is a, is a pejorative term. First of all, I, com I completely agree with John Cager. You've in had fact, that experience. In fact, indeed. In fact, uh, uh, you mentioned that I, I, I a, was at least a sculptor. And I have a, my one bronze piece that I have is called Three People in the Cathedral. And that's the very point of it, is to show how going in the cathedral just exalts you. And the, the three people have sort of taken on this, this you would say, transcendent uh, attitude from their presence in this amazing building. I am, I am uh, a lover of cathedrals.